Hello everybody, uh, welcome and uh, sorry for the delay. There was a lengthy uh, lecture before us um, that taught a sub subject we didn't really understand. <laughs> and uh, so it took a bit longer to install the camera. Um, I hope that our friends uh, online can hear us as well. It's the first time we do such a thing. So it's a bit of an experiment. I think we will get better from week to week. Um, and yeah, so let's, let's see how it's going. Um, today we have the first event uh, of the lecture series, uh, which is organized in the context of TRACE, uh, the Forschungszentrum Transformations of Political Violence. Um, it's a collaborative research center uh, by five institutions here in Hesse, um, amongst them uh, the Zentrum für Konfliktforschung, Center for Conflict Studies, um, that's us. Um, my name is Felix Ander. Um, I work here at the center and I um, organized this lecture series together with my colleague uh, Marie Reis, um, who will say um, a couple of words in a minute. And uh, before we start, I wanted to mention just one thing um, for the students, um, because this lecture can also be taken as a regular class in the curriculum. Um, if you have not yet registered in Marvin, please do so. Um, if you have registered, you received an email by me with all the information. If you have more questions, just send me an email. And if an anything went wrong, um, please just contact me after the lecture or send me an email. Um, I don't want to talk too much um, about the formalities, so please do go next. Yeah. Thank you, and thanks for um, showing up in such um, yeah, large numbers. It's great to have you all, and it's amazing to have the first panel for the series. Um, as Felix said, I'm Mariel uh, Rice. I work at the Center as Postdoc in the um, TRACE project, and um, this is, as you know, the first lecture of a lecture series that we're organizing within TRACE. Um, and the title is Transformations of Political Violence, and this is what we will be looking at throughout the semester. So we have international, um, internationally renowned scholars and uh, scholars from within the TRACE um, framework who will um, give us a glimpse of their research working on different aspects of political violence and transformations of political violence. Um, and we have a, an amazing and very timely panel discussion um, today and then from next week on we have um, usually one lecture and then at the end of the semester we have another panel session um, and I think I'll just leave it at that um, and we just dive into the what we're here for today and thank you so much for coming and for hosting and uh, over to you Torsten. Thank you, um, great, thank you and welcome to everybody here in Zoom um, in the bigger world outside and a big thank you to Marielle and Felix who organized the whole lecture series. Um, as they just mentioned, on behalf of the Research Center uh, on Transformations of Political Violence, uh, this uh, interdisciplinary center was established um, this spring and uh, brings together different institutions uh, in the state of Hesse that conducting um, research, conducting con research on peace, conflict, violence for many years, which is the University of Darmstadt, the University of Frankfurt, uh, Gießen University, Marburg University, and also the Peace Research Institute in Frankfurt. And um, both the center, but also, of course, this lecture series as part of the center is funded by the Federal Ministry of um, Education and uh, Research, for which we are very grateful, as it allows us to organize these events uh, and also dialogues um, and, and other conferences, but also research for PhD students and postdoc researchers uh, now for the next four years. So you will hear from us uh, in the next four uh, years. Um, so uh, my name is Thorsten Bonak. I'm Professor for Peace and Conflict Studies here at the Center for Conflict Studies in Marburg. I'm also a member uh, of TRACE. Um, I'm directing two MA programs in Marburg on Peace and Conflict Studies. I'm also a speaker of the DFG-funded Collaborative Research Center Dynamics of Security of the universities in Marburg and Gießen. And I'm very happy um, that I'm accompanied here by four um, distinguished um, panelists, which I will introduce um, in the moment. Um, the panel itself is an excellent opportunity um, to uh, fulfill one of the main tasks of our research center, and this is also to initiate a dialogue on contemporary 
issues not only amongst academics but also with students uh, but also the wider um, public and as I said this panel is really a very good opportunity to do so um, and it's on on a topic which is certainly one of the most uh, important and burning uh, issues on in the context of political um, violence at the moment and this is the Russian aggression against Ukraine um, which as you know began um, at the latest with the annexation of Crimea um, and which have become in become an all-out war since uh, the Russian attack on Ukraine on February 24th. So in our panel discussion we will cover a couple of aspects um, related to the war uh, but we would also like um, to discuss how the war um, impacts our understanding of researching um, political violence and its transformations. So the question is, do we need uh, to focus on different theories? Do we need to change our methodologies, our research methods, uh, when we investigate political violence on the background of the Russian-Ukrainian um, war? So we will have a two kind of different uh, layers in our discussion. One is really um, directly related to the topic and the other one is more related to well, how do we do research and how do we communicate also to, to the wider, wider public. Uh, so with that I would like to introduce our uh, panelists. Um, very briefly, I mean in, in a globally connected world with the internet it's very easy uh, to uh, to check them out and to check out what they are doing. So visit their websites for the research profiles. Uh, so just a few words. Um, just next to me, uh, it's Dr. Ivan Bakalov. Um, he is a lecturer at Leiden University. <laughs> we are enlightened now um, here. Um, he is lecturer at Leiden University in the Netherlands and also a junk lecturer at the Department of International Relations in the University of National and World Economy in Sofia, Bulgaria. Um, he received his uh, PhD from the University of Bremen in Germany for a dissertation on setting soft power in motion, tracing the mechanisms of Russian soft power in Ukraine. So directly related, obviously, to, to our topic here. He has written a couple of articles on this topic um, for the Journal of, for, of, Inter of Political Power and also the European Journal of International Relations. And he also conducted research both in Ukraine uh, and Russia. And next year, I'm very happy about that, he will join the Collaborative Research Center Dynamics of Security at Marburg and Gießen University as a research fellow. Looking forward so to continue our exchange. Um, then just to, to the left of me, it's Yulia Kornishova. Um, Dr. Kornishova is a postdoc researcher at the Forschungsstelle Osteuropa University of Bremen. She came to Bremen from Tübingen, where she was a research fellow at the Institute for International Relations and Politics. Um, she is a former uh, researcher at the Institute of International Relations at Taras Shevchenko National University of Kiev and also a foreign policy expert um, for the Institute for Social and Economic Research in Kiev. Um, she received uh, her PhD uh, from the Taras Shevchenko University on the, for a PhD thesis on the Berlin crisis of 1948 to 1963 and foreign policy of the United States um, in that context. She has published a lot of articles and policy papers, for example, on modern trends in security provision at the international level, on Putin and Ukraine, on military conflict in Ukraine and the use of United Nations mechanisms and re resolutions, but also on Ukrainian uh, foreign policy. Um, and then to my far left, so to say, uh, Professor Monika Wingender. Uh, she is professor for Slavic studies at the Justus Liebig University in Gießen since 2001. Uh, she was, was the founding director of the Gießen Center for Eastern European Studies at Gießen University. And his research is, um, his res her research focuses on social linguistic, also uh, by training she is a social linguistic, uh, contact linguistic, linguistic conflict research and language policy, uh, policies in Slavic countries. Um, from her numerous publications I only want to uh, mention two recent ones which, which are particularly interested um, for our discussion today and this is an article, an edited book as a volume on language politics, language situations and conflicts in multilingual societies, 
case studies from contemporary Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, um, published in 2021. And then an article on contested bilingualism in Ukraine and Russia concepts of language conflict and contact and conflict linguistics, so also pretty much related to what we want to talk here. And then to my right here, it's Dr. Kerstin Zimmer. She's a senior researcher and lecturer at the Center for Conflict Studies in Marburg. She joined the center in 2005. Uh, a year before, she obtained her PhD with a dissertation on power elites in the Ukrainian Donbas, conditions and consequences on the transformations of an old industrial region. Um, and since then, she also has repeatedly conducted research on and in Ukraine, but she also organized a couple of summer schools, for example, in Kiev and Mikolaev, um, and uh, yeah, discussed uh, several topics uh, with students from the region, but I guess also um, with German students. So how will we proceed? So the idea is uh, to have two or three rounds of questions and answers, discussions here um, on the panel, and then open the discussion for contributions uh, from the audience um, here in the room. And in the first round, I would like to invite our panelists to reflect on the war, and in particular about the aggression from uh, 24th of February against Ukraine on the background of their own research. So based on your own research, your academic or maybe also your personal background, what were your thoughts around February 24th? Did you expect this escalation um, of war? So what, is your, what were your kind of um, feelings and thoughts on that very day and around that event and since uh, then? And I guess we can follow the alphabetic order given by your last day, which would mean that Ivan would start. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Thorsten. Thank you for the introduction, and thanks uh, to the organizing for the uh, for bringing this panel together. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I would like to share a few thoughts about um, about uh, the impact of the war, but in terms of um, the transformations of the dynamics of state society relations in Russia. Um, this, of course, is not the main topic is not the whole topic, but uh, nonetheless, I think there, uh, there are important developments there that can help us um, in the effort to make sense of the senselessness um, of, the, of the ongoing violence uh, against Ukraine. Um, so you could think of this in terms of uh, the political economy of uh, violence in the context of uh, Russian uh, state society relations. Um, and I would like to, in particular, um, just cover just two, two uh, themes or topics. One is about the relationship between state and capital um, in Russia currently, and also between state and labor um, in, the, in the ongoing transformation. Um, in terms of state and capital, um, um, violence is enterprise. This is not necessarily anything new uh, for research on violence. We, we've had uh, private military companies before. Uh, we've, we know about the, um, uh, the broken, um, the barrier monopoly on violence that the state uh, allegedly had for a long period of time. What is new now, however, is that you have uh, different aspects to that relationship. So uh, it's not only the monopoly on violence that is being broken, but it's also uh, the monopoly on accounting for justice uh, that is being broken, um, especially in the context of uh, private companies recruiting troops uh, in prisons in exchange for uh, making sentences disappear. Uh, so this is a new type of relationship that is perhaps uh, worth um, studying further. Um, another aspect uh, to this is um, uh, the absence of violence. Uh, usually when we study violence, uh, violence, we want to focus on situation where it's present. Um, but in certain situations where you would expect violence and you don't see it, um, I think it's worth um, analyzing in the broader context of the, uh, of the societal constellations. And what I'm talking about is the ongoing mobilization in Russia. Um, where you have a mobilization of human uh, power, but you don't have a mobilization of economic resource. On the contrary, actually, the state is in a process of uh, providing different types of support for, uh, for business and large capital. So the absence in violence in that context where normally a full-scale mobilization would involve a mobilization of economic resources um, is, uh, is worth um, analyzing from the perspective of what we haven't done so far. 
Um, and just a couple of words on, on, the, on the flip side, so state and labor relations and how they were transformed um, in the context of the, uh, of the war. Um, and again, we start with something that we, that we know. Uh, violence as labor uh, is not anything new, um, but um, it, there are interesting developments in Russia where uh, you see how um, support for the war correlates with lack of participation if you look at the different social groups uh, in the society. So there's a process of the of, uh, you could call it the commodification of violence, uh, where uh, where the price, the labor price, is uh, is pushed down, and uh, people from underdeveloped regions in Russia um, engage in um, in mass violence uh, due to the incentives that are uh, developed by the by the capitalist system in in Russia. Um, I would like to uh, conclude this uh, short introductory. Uh, um, uh, input with a few thoughts on the new forms of resistance that we also see um, in this transformed state society dynamic, um, namely the introduction of violent uh, practices in the resistance to the state. Um, and there's a, both a quantitative and a qualitative change here. The quantitative is that is related to the increased intensity of uh, violent resistance um, acts. Uh, so, for example, throwing Molotov cocktails at military commissariats or, um, or uh, destroying the um, transport infrastructure uh, within the country that would impede uh, the transport of military equipment and troops. Um, there's an increasing intensi there's an in intensification of that repertoire. Um, but there's also qualitative change. So, for example, you had opposition groups in Russia which previously were committed to um, a nonviolent uh, means to uh, resistance, which have now shifted um, explicitly to um, to violent means. So, for example, the group around Navalny uh, is now openly calling uh, calling for uh, violent resistance. Of course, with a focus on cyber attacks, but implicitly uh, also within a broader spectrum of, of violent resistance uh, performances. Um, so these are uh, um, the, the thoughts that have been driving my uh, thinking uh, in the, over the previous months. Um, and uh, yeah, I would like to, I would, I would look forward to hearing from the other panelists and see how we um, <laughs> can push this further. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Ivan. I guess we will come back to a couple yeah. of, of issues in particular. Uh, the violent resistance, but also how well violence is kind of institutionalized in the political system, maybe also to a certain extent the society uh, in Russia. But I would give uh, the mic over to Julia. Um, I mean, um, I guess it really makes a difference whether you experience this violence, uh, not only being from Ukraine, but also uh, being in Ukraine uh, at that very moment. Also. I mean, both from an academic but also personal level, maybe you can share some insights and thoughts about your yeah, feeling and, and experiences. Thank you, Thorsten, and uh, thank you for inviting me for this event. I think it's very uh, important that Ukrainian voice is finally being heard. And uh, I'm talking not particularly about me, <laughs> <laughs> about Ukrainian voice in general. Uh, yeah, and uh, Torsten already made kind of introduction about my background. So before the full-scale invasion, I combined like uh, two spheres of my work. I was a practitioner. I was involved in the uh, one major project <coughs> you supported with facilitated reforms uh, pro uh, process in Ukraine. And on the other hand, I was actively commented on international developments and uh, Ukraine's foreign policy. Uh, but the shock of 24th of February uh, was uh, so strong that I'm being a scholar and who used to study all this historical memory, I experienced on myself everything that I heard and read about before. All this traumatic vision, all this uh, trauma experience. Of course, it cannot be compared with the people who uh, experience war even closer, but it still was very painful. And I had to flee uh, end of February when uh, Russian troops uh, fired almost all regions of Ukraine. And there were huge queues 
uh, to leave uh, the cities, uh, Ukraine, and huge uh, queues uh, at the borderlines. Yeah, it was really traumatic experience. Luckily, the walk uh, became kind of remedy, and I started to rebunk uh, Russian strategic narratives and uh, security dimension of the war. And for my research, I have uh, chosen several research streams. I started uh, with an analysis of the analogical reasoning and uh, how key stakeholders, Russia, Ukraine, and even the European Union, how they use different historical analogies and metaphors uh, to justify to prove their policies. Uh, and uh, it was very interesting for me as a historian, especially a person who defended its PhD thesis on Cold War and Berlin crisis, and all this bilateral standoff and nuclear blackmailing, you know. And because uh, uh, Russian President Putin is very fond of history himself, uh, I hadn't have a lack of empirical material. Uh, and when I tried to deconstruct uh, those uh, narratives, I logically came to another research question. Um, actually, how does Ukraine uh, manage uh, to cope and uh, to resist and to withstand this overwhelming force of Russian troops? And not only on the battlefield, but also on the societal and institutional level. And uh, it brought me to the questions like uh, Ukrainian resilience and uh, Ukrainian civil society networking and how it uh, helps uh, to sustain the invasion. And one more research interest of mine that I'd like to mention is the implication of the war for the security order, because I think that the old security order is gone and we are witnessing the formation of something new in real time. And uh, the main question, uh, research question, which I want to address is whether those insecurities produced by Russian war in Ukraine and beyond Ukraine, I mean food insecurity, human insecurity, energy insecurity, and nuclear insecurity, uh, do they lead to some kind of consolidated response from the West, or will they produce kind of opposite effects, like a kind of fatigue of this uh, war? And of course, it will have a direct uh, implication for Ukraine and for its uh, support from the Western countries. And my current hypothesis is that uh, proliferation of these insecurities and this uh, crisis is a kind of uh, global uh, security breach as opposed to regional uh, conflict. And it's good because it strengthens the basis for material and political support for Ukraine. So I can say that my positionality is uh, displayed a uh, displaced scholar provides me like uh, with additional insights about different insecurities, even though, yeah, that uh, to be displayed uh, also bears a lot of uh, difficulties, let's say. Yeah, thank you, Yulia. Uh, I guess we also will come back to a couple of, of issues, um, not only propositionality questions, which are kind of combined with research methods and methodologies, uh, but also, as, as you said, historical dimensions, uh, which are very present um, also in, uh, in the war itself. Um, speaking of his history and maybe also uh, well, being or having an historical perspective um, on, the, on the country, but also a kind of well, sociolinguistic uh, perspective on how social uh, how linguistic issues are kind of also interwoven with the, with the overall well, conflict. Um, Monica, what were your thoughts around 24th of February? Yeah, thank you very much, Thorsten, and thank you very much, uh, um, all organizers, uh, to inviting me for this uh, plenary discussion. 
Um, I would like to briefly outline four thematic fields uh, of my research background, uh, which combine um, or, or connect language, war, and violence. Firstly, dealing with language diversity in the Soviet heritage in language situation and language policy in multilingual post-Soviet states, multilingual, multilingualism is uh, a challenge for each state. We observe in the post-Soviet states different models of dealing with language diversity. Russia follows the Euro um, the model of the, the Soviet model of the equality of uh, languages, but de facto fosters a monolingual language uh, policy that is fostering only Russian as the state language. This is symbolized uh, by the difference between Rasiski, this encompasses all 130 um, ethnic groups and languages in Russia, in Russia and Ruski, Russian. And um, under Putin's rule, this difference between Rasiski and Ruski um, developed step by step in only and just uh, Ruski, Russian. So we can say that under Putin's rule uh, in Russia, um, we have now de facto a strict limitation and restriction of the national languages. Um, and in principle, this is the concept of Putin's Russian world within the Russian Federation. He does within the Russian Federation in principle the same as uh, outside. In Ukraine, the language diversity is even more complex uh, because Ukraine has besides numerous minority languages, uh, two languages which are equally used, Russian and Ukrainian, and furthermore, various forms of bilingualism and Surik, a mixed variety of Russian and uh, Ukrainian. Concerning the Soviet heritage in Ukraine language policy, we um, observe here, since its independence, um, de-Sovietization uh, of the Soviet language policy, and uh, what is the problem here, the oscillation between two trends, Russification and Ukrainization, and this changed with, with each presidency in Ukraine, and this is one of the factors and reason for the politicization of the language issue in Ukraine. My second research field is uh, language conflict research. We um, already talked about this, and here I try to develop um, a linguistic branch of uh, general conflict studies and to combine and uh, to connect intensively social science conflict research with uh, conflict research in the humanities. We may talk about this later on. And uh, this is combined, this Soviet, the dealing with the Soviet heritage and language conflicts with another research focus I have with language and ideologies, language-based nation building. You know maybe the concept uh, of Russian as Veliki i Maguchi Ruski Yezik. It's in English, great and mighty Russian language. This is a leitmotif of Russian culture introduced by Ivan Turgenev and connected uh, also with the uh, Russian standard language of Pushkin. The, this cultural and language concept of Veliki Maguchi Ruski Yezik finds its way into the ideology of uh, Russian Mir, of Putin's Russian Mir. In Ukraine, language ideologies underline the function of language as language is a weapon, uh, and the language issue was uh, the subject of election campaigns. I uh, already talked about this, that with each president in uh, Ukraine, language policy changed. And interestingly, um, President Zelensky was the first president who said that language uh, does not matter. It changed, of course, now in the times of war, you know, his very media experience and uses now the power of language in his speeches. And last but not least, my fourth uh, thematic field is um, languages and war. And here, research questions uh, from sociolinguistics uh, are numerous. I just want to stress a few aspects. What is the impact of the war on the minority languages in Ukraine? Think of dramatic developments in wartime such as escape and displacement. And what does it mean for the two most used languages in Ukraine, Ukrainian and Russian? Russian is now stigmatized as the language of the aggressor. Ukrainian developed from the symbolic state language to the language of the resistance. 
What does it mean for the future of bilingualism in Ukraine? How might be the Ukrainian language policy deal with the Russian language in the future in Ukraine? In which way will develop identity building processes in Ukraine? <clears throat> I mean here the area of tension between language identities, national, ethnic, state identities, and so on. And last but not least, linguists are faced with the huge task of analyzing language as medium in war, in form of propaganda, rhetoric, and of course in form of legitimization strategies of violence. And all these four thematic fields are concerned with questions of violence in the last thematic field, language and war, it, the interrelationship of language and violence is more than obvious, but the other research areas are also connected to this. Thus, uh, language conflict manifests themselves in very various forms of violence. One example is the dismantling or removing of monuments in Ukraine as a means of de-Russification and earlier decommunization. And the last word on language and violence that is running like a red tape through my analysis and research. I use language and violence in different meanings. Firstly, metaphorically, violence speak, speaks a certain language. Secondly, language as medium of violence, uh, I mean here rhetoric. Thirdly, violence through language, uh, for example, through propaganda, through hate speech, uh, and so on. And last but not, not least, language about violence. I mean here, remembering violence or the legitimization of war, and so on. Thank you, Monica. I mean, a lot of questions. I really would like to, I mean, address all of them in the, in, in the next um, couple of, of minutes. But of course, we need to focus on on some, I think that, I mean, it's very obvious that the language does play a, a crucial role, not only in the conflict itself, but also in the whole kind of history uh, before the conflict really then, um, yeah, I mean, uh, escalated. Um. Kerstin, finally you, uh, on the first round, I mean, looking back, I mean, you conducted PhD research in the early 2000s. I mean, looking back, this was this an entire different world uh, and what, what has changed uh, or what was your kind of feeling what has changed uh, now being at a full-scale war between uh, Russia and Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you and thank you for putting together this interesting uh, panel, very diverse um, foci here. Um, yes, um, as you said, I did my, my research mainly at the end of the 1990s, early 2000s in, um, in the Donbass. And um, for me, uh, it became very obvious that uh, it, as, as we all know, Ukraine is a real, really diverse country due to historical reasons, but uh, both my research and other research uh, has shown that um, regional identity was the strongest in the Donbass compared to other regions in Ukraine where, like, identification with the Ukrainian national state was much stronger and there was less attachment um, to a specific place. Um, but this, um, this attachment to the region had very specific traits. So uh, it was very much infused by um, Soviet identity or Soviet sponsored identity, like always having been the showcase or at least in the early times having been the showcase of Socialism, uh, like uh, the stronghold of the working class, um, and so on and so forth. So people often referred back both to Soviet times. And even if they referred to the region, the region had the same traits that were always um, referred to as, uh, as the Soviet Union. So it was kind of a mini Soviet Union in a way, in a, way, in a specific way. Um, and there was this very um, interesting uh, result that people in the Donbass, uh, mainly speaking about Donetsk region, not so that much about Lugansk, um, they did not really need the rest of Ukraine for their own identification. Whereas one of my colleagues did lots of research in Lviv and was the other way around. They always talked about the East and distinguished themselves from the East, um, of course in very positive ways, 
whereas in a specific way it didn't seem necessary for people um, in the East. And uh, as Monika Wingende has already mentioned, um, there was a high degree of politicization of language um, policy in, or the language issue in general in, uh, in various rounds of elections, so mainly presidential elections, but also parliamentary elections. And that was also, also the same with general regional differences and also creating kinds of enemy images of one or the other region uh, for electoral purposes. And even so, many um, politicians, presidents in Ukraine claimed to, well, wanting to unite the nation, um, finding things in common in practical terms, in political terms. They always um, resorted to specific tactics in order to gain more votes from, um, from specific regions. That was one thing. Um, and I would say after uh, 2004, there were quite a lot of um, tendencies of what I would call really othering in Ukraine, othering the East, othering the Donbas by specific, not by all, by specific um, Ukrainian political um, elites and also academics, uh, which led um, to a feeling of not being wanted. Um, in the country um, for many people um, in the Donbass. And uh, on the other hand, still feeling that the Donbass is really the most important region at the same time. In, in Ukraine, being the industrial heart, feeding the whole country, this image was also cherished, again, by other politicians. So there was this very contradictor contradictory situation um, and also a high degree of um, social decline um, and uh, ecological decline in the region, which, which also led to frustrations. So, um, in a way, um, that might explain why um, the separatists were successful in a way in the Donbass, but not in other regions. There were also attempts in 2014 in Kharkiv, in Odessa, but it didn't work out. It only worked out in some way um, in the Donbass. Um, and uh, one of the reasons, interestingly, is also a high degree of um, passiveness in, in the country. So um, there were um, a couple of um, surveys at the time, at the beginning of 2014, and people in general in the southeast of, in the east of Ukraine were asked what they would do if there was a full-scale uh, full invasion um, of Russian forces in Ukraine. And uh, like the possibilities ranged from um, I defend uh, Ukraine or I join the Russian forces. And interestingly, most people in the Donbass would say, I simply stay at home. I don't do anything. Um, and I would say this is one of the reasons why the separatists could be successful in that region. Because in all the other regions, people would say, we will defend. We will defend Ukraine. And for, what, for various reasons, this um, passiveness was really pervasive in the country. It had lots of, of uh, things, I think, to do also with specific political events, political culture, the clan structure um, in the region, uh, which really dominated people and also led to their, especially political passivity, and um, um, yeah, made it possible um, for separatists to be successful here. But I didn't think that it would work out. Um, I thought it wouldn't because I thought it's just, again, political blackmail by those people from the Donbass, just as they did in 2004 after the, the Orange Revolution. They also threatened with uh, separatism, but then found a kind of an arrangement with a new government um, in, new, um, in, in Kiev. Uh, but this time, I think they simply went too far, especially Renat Akhmetov, <coughs> and they couldn't stop it then. So. That's yeah. Thank you, Kerstin. Um, I would like to pick this up um, and talking a bit more about, first of all, uh, Ukraine and later coming back um, to, to Russia. Uh, and the turning or shifting a bit the focus from the Donbas uh, region to also the rest of the country, and maybe uh, asking um, Yulia, because you, you already mentioned the Ukrainian resistance, which is really 
really successful, right? So and it's up to the uh, latest military success also in the East now. So putting, uh, pushing kind of uh, Russia back uh, into parts of the separatist region, so to say. Um, and I mean, from, from your point of view and your, your, your research and your, and your experiences, what are the, I mean, resources for this Ukrainian resistance also with regard to, as you said, I mean, well, nation building and kind of uh, the history of Ukraine and the relationship to, to, to Russia. So what would you say are the, well, the cornerstones of this success apart, I mean, part of it is obviously the military um, support, but also apart from that uh, kind of more ma material uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so to answer your question, I would start probably that Ukraine had a kind of very complicated history. <laughs> and uh, through the 20th century, Ukraine had to overcome so many uh, crises, wars, uh, hungers, genocide, that uh, we had uh, enough of um, uh, enough of uh, options to develop some kind of coping mechanisms, you know. Uh, another uh, point which I would like to highlight that Ukrainian society is very horizontal one, mm -hmm. meaning, and it's I would highlight it as a major difference from the Russian society. Ukrainian society is very horizontal. Uh, it uh, doesn't admit uh, any, let's say, hierarchy. And it can be confirmed by two revolutions back in 2004 and 2013-14, uh, when uh, uh, we uh, decided that we do not uh, appreciate, we do not agree with our government, and we ousted them. Yeah? Uh, and uh, based on that, on this horizontal structure of the society, uh, the third thing that I would like to highlight is a very uh, active grassroots activism. And if we look at this uh, full-scale invasion in February, uh, the next day there were lines in the so-called commissariats with uh, average people try to get weapon mm -hmm. and uh, try uh, to uh, <coughs> get into the so-called uh, voluntary battalions for defense of their communities or their cities. So our president decided not to flee and it was a very major signal uh, that we have to resist and uh, the wider su society supported this message and uh, it, the result of it was the uh, supply of civilians and uh, militaries with all the necessary staff, self-organization, when neighbor helped neighbors. And I also actually want to reflect uh, that uh, Eastern region used to feel separated, like they do not need the rest of Ukraine. They used to live like this. But it's very interesting that IDPs from Donbass mm -hmm. and from Lugansk, Donetsk region used to go to the west and there they were warmly accepted despite all the language differences, all the political differences. They were provided with housing, they were provided with food, with some uh, necessary medical uh, support. And I don't actually think that we still can speak about this uh, relevance of language division. Because, you know, uh, Putin said that we are going <coughs> to liberate this eastern Novorossia. Yeah? In wider terms, Lugansk, Donetsk, even Kharkiv, uh, part of Kherson, Mikolaev regions. But people exactly there demonstrated such a harsh, such a strong resistance uh, that I think they show pretty well that they don't want to be liberated. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you just mentioned now the, 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 the question of, of uh, language, language division, language policies. I mean, Monica, would you second this? Or what, does, what role does uh, language play both? I mean, with regard to divisions, but also with regard to the Ukrainian resistance to being united now against the Russian invasion? Uh, 
Yeah, I uh, completely agree with you. Um, Ukrainian becomes now more and more the language of the resistance. This is true. And one sign is, for example, that politicians and other, other public people now switch to Ukrainian. And even the President Zelensky, who is uh, from, from his mother tongue uh, Russian speaking, he switches in the public um, uh, events now um, to, to Ukrainian language. This is one of the signs. And uh, I completely agree with you about graf grassroots activism in Ukraine and grassroots movements. We have the same in language policy um, since the Euromaidan and earlier times that language activism is very strong in Ukrainian. This is also a sign for the uh, role of the language in this society. And language activism means that uh, people support Ukrainian language. Um, and uh, here we have the example um, in the last time that um, activists um, try to convince people to switch to Ukrainian. And they have a lot of different movements, for example, in the internet, a movement that they help people with didactic material to learn um, quickly Ukrainian, to switch to Ukrainian, and so on. So the role of language activism is um, a very, very uh, great in Ukraine. May I have one comment to Kerstin? Mm -hmm. um, very interesting, your point about the regional identity in Donbass. Um, <coughs> We have the other identity building in the West. This may be the two contrary identity building processes with uh, the West. And then we have um, the uh, center of Ukraine, the big cities where it's, it's more mixed. But um, regarding the regional identity in Donbass, what about there with uh, Ukrainian speaking Ukrainians in Donbass? Is it really a homogeneous? regional identity because a lot of refugees now in Germany coming from the east are Rus Russian speaking and not Ukrainian speaking as uh, first language. Okay, this is my question <coughs> about the hom homogeneity of the uh, term regional <coughs> identity in Donbass. Um, I would say there were both Ukrainian and Russian speakers, so mostly Russian speakers in the cities but it, still in the countryside. I mean, it, always called an industrialized region but if you just travel through the Donbass uh, it, it's not just industry it's also lots of agriculture small villages and so forth so people would rather speak Ukrainian or you mentioned Zuzhik in in the um, in the villages but nevertheless this very strong image of this industrial region I think it was pervasive it differed a little bit in the smaller cities like uh, Bakhmut or at the time Artyomovsk and um, but uh, they would n nevertheless take pride in coming um, from the region. But on the other hand, all all people I met in um, in the Donbas, most most of them were Russian speakers, or as their first language. But they were completely most of them completely able to speak Ukrainian. So if somebody just called in the office and spoke Ukrainian on the phone, they would immediately switch. So and it's also very interesting. Um, that especially at um, the political level, people often claim that Russian speakers in Ukraine were um, discriminated. Um, but on the other hand, surveys show that in everyday life, people did not feel any discrimination, right? It was just a political thing uh, to say Russian language uh, is being suppressed. Uh, but the experience of people also in the East was, if I speak Russian, that's fine. Nobody really cares, right? That's absolutely accepted. So there was, again, this difference between everyday practices of language use and the political usage of this whole issue. Yeah. Um, thank you. I mean, I would, I would uh, like to uh, continue the discussion on resistance, uh, to be honest, but now <laughs> focusing on, on Russia, because you mentioned this in the very beginning, <coughs> that there is a growing Resistance and also violent resistance. Mm -hmm. the resistance now against the uh, Putin regime. Um, oh, I mean, do you see any? Well, is is there any indication that there is really a challenge uh, for this uh, regime? Uh, whether this is uh, due to well um, grassroots civil society opposition activism, or whether this is from the inner circle and a division of elites. I mean. Timothy Snyder made a really a mm -hmm. strong point that 
we uh, will see a division within the Russian elite and because there are different power centers and that there will be a more kind of conflictual situ uh, situation uh, within Russia. So mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for the question. Um, and you do indeed um, identify two dimensions uh, to this uh, division or this uh, uh, or at least to this discussion. Uh, first is the division within society, um, right, as represented by, uh, but m by new forms of resistance and by partial uh, intensification of resistance. Of course, this is uh, not on a level that can uh, sort of put uh, the overall uh, structure into, um, into, uh, into a significant challenge, uh, but it does uh, at least uh, provide like responsive reactions. So now you have uh, um, representatives of the National Guard stationed with uh, military commissariats uh, across the country in a uh, move that recognizes uh, at least the existence of, of this, if not the, uh, the potence of the threat. Um, and it really doesn't seem that uh, this grassroots resistance really puts significant uh, mm -hmm. any any significant challenge to the to the um, stability of the regime at least it doesn't seem to be the case at this stage um, I think the the more interesting question is the the transformation of the of the proverbial mm -hmm. social contract in Russia um, and this uh, touches upon something that you mentioned uh, with uh, with respect to Ukraine uh, Kirsten, with the the passivity mm -hmm. so um, for 20 years, uh, people were told that, that they should uh, be passive in the sense that uh, when it comes to violence, so for example, uh, violence was only in the purview of the state. So when the state um, enacts violence, then the rest, everyone should stay put, mind their own business um, and not engage in uh, political activity. What we see now um, is that it's actually the state that is asking people to mobilize, to come together, not only that, but it's also arming people, including people who are potential dissenters. Uh, so for many years, it was the case that people coming together was considered uh, uh, the greatest <coughs> risk for the stability of the regime. And the state was very effective uh, in neutralizing that, in fragmenting the society. And now what we see is that the state is bringing people together arming them um, and we already um, um, we, we already witnessed the first mass shooting uh, at the mobilization camp. Um, I would be surprised if it's the last one uh, whether this can escalate uh, and in what direction I really have no clue and I think this already touches into the second dimension of the of the split uh, within the elites whether there is a, such a thing or not. Um, it seems, at least um, from, from an outsider's perspective, that the recent um, losses in, uh, on the battlefield uh, for the first time um, um, laid bare certain differences within the, within the elites. So you, had the, you have the far right <coughs> who are pushing for, more, um, um, for a more radical engagement in a, in a total war. Um, which is going further than what seemed to be the established policy at the time. At the same time, those are also the people who now have their private militias. Um, so you have people like Prigozhin with uh, private military companies. You have people like uh, Kadyrov who also has a private, privatized um, um, militia. Um, if if this spirals out of control, of course, these people would be the ones with resources that are very re relevant in the context of, uh, of such a conflict. Um, so it is a possible trajectory nonetheless, uh, but it's, uh, it's, still, it's still developing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. I think it would be really interesting to, to follow up on this and see whether this war really turns into also a, uh, a bigger crisis than in Russia, kind of a, a backfire, if you wish, mm -hmm. uh, of what's what's going what's going on now, um, I would like to shift our discussion a bit now uh, to the second layer, uh, which is about which is whether this war also challenges our concepts, our understandings, our theories, methods in uh, researching transformations of, of political um, violence. Um, and I mean, Julia, you, you are just 
um, mentioned it also in the beginning, uh, that this can also be the case, that we also need to reconsider a bit our, um, our well, conceptual approaches. And there's now the ongoing debate initiated by, uh, by some um, scholars from uh, realism, in, in particular in the US, that we do need more geopolitical, more realist thinking in international relations in order to understand war, not so much now from a constructivist, critical point of view, but more, let's say, uh, focusing again on the hard issues, on hard power, right? Um, yeah, I see from your face that you are not agreeing with that. <laughs> uh, that's fine, but maybe you can kind of uh, well counteract to this to this <coughs> argument. Uh, so, what do we need now in order to understand uh, this uh, this wa Russian war against Ukraine? Uh, thank you, thank you, Dorson, for this great question. Yeah, you are quite right. I do not agree, and I think that research of violence has been under the shadow of this realistic approach for the long time. And the major problem with this geopolitical or realistical interpretation of the Russian war in Ukraine is the fact of normalization of violence is a kind of inevitable outcome of some structural circumstances. Be it, for instance, EU and NATO enlargement or uh, Euro-Atlantic dominance after the end of Cold War or the failure of politics of, of spheres of influence, and so on and so forth. But this approach has several very important flaws, and let me elaborate on them a little bit. Uh, I, I will start with maybe a pretty obvious point that a realist approach uh, neglects uh, the agency of the mid-sized and small countries. Like, like Ukraine. And so maybe because of this, President Putin is very fond of realistic approach. And uh, yeah, just recently, uh, through his Turkish mediators, he hinted that uh, he wants uh, a new grant deal uh, with the West. And if you read uh, through the lines, it becomes very obvious that it has very uh, small to do with the Ukraine, but it's all about Russia and US and some major European countries. Like there is a new reality, there is new Russia, let's make a new big deal, uh, which will be relations between us. Yeah. Uh, but uh, apparently that Kremlin is very interested in the establishing of this kind of realistic or geopolitical order. But at the same time, it means that uh, he tries to diminish everything, all this norm-based or normative approach uh, which Europe has been standing for since the end of Cold War. And you know, I'm very surprised that in Europe or in the US there are some politicians or experts uh, who still think that, yes, yeah, there is some valid uh, reasoning in Putin's uh, thinks that, yeah, we can do it either uh, for preserving of spheres of influence or struggling for multipolarity or so on and so forth. Uh, my second point is that realist approach neglects uh, dehumanization of enemy and societal uh, predisposition to violence. And I think that as an alternative, a more fruitful approach, uh, I would uh, recall the necropolitics. And uh, uh, if you're already aware about this approach, it's good. If not, I am very encourage you uh, to dig deeper. Uh, it's actually uh, coined by the Achil Mbembe, <laughs> and it suggests uh, that the sovereign state can decide, can decide who uh, will die and who will live and by doing so underpins its sovereignty. Sovereign state is one who can kill without legal punishment. And uh, the logic of sovereign state is in order to live, uh, you can kill your enemy. And I think that it's pretty much applicable to the Russian war in Ukraine right now. Uh, and. Um, to develop my point any further, uh, I want to say that necropolitics is expressed 
uh, through the constant search of enemies, uh, either ideological or rational other, and unleashing of wars. And I want to remind you that the initial invasion was based on narratives of uh, fighting the Nazis in Ukraine and junta and uh, Russian propaganda blamed Ukrainian uh, government as a Nazi one. Uh, so they created a picture of the worst enemy that can be in regarding to Russians. And uh, yeah, it, it's interesting that after the explosion at the uh, Kerch Bridge uh, just recently, this narrative uh, has twisted a bit. And now Putin uh, picture Ukrainians not as Nazis, but as terrorists, which also uh, has very interesting implications and connotations as for the domestic audience so abroad. Because in many minds, uh, we used to consider terrorists as uh, non-state actors, yeah? And this is how Putin invites the world to see Ukraine, as a non-state. Uh, when he addresses Ukraine, uh, he does it like nominally and very often add to this, and the true masters of Ukraine in the West. And, uh, yeah, and, um, uh, to make uh, this my long presentation short, I just want to point another uh, mm, interesting thought, which I think is a necropolitical sacralization of violence. And again, I will refer to Achille Mbembe, uh, who draws attention to the morbid uh, spectacle of suffering. And we need to remember that during the decades, Russia has built almost a religious cult around its victory over fascism. And the main outcome of this victory is an enormous number of victims, and especially in the comparison of Western casualties. And uh, Russian propaganda and Putin used to say, oh, we have 30 million of victims. This is something that should be glorified and sanctified. And you know, excuse me if my, uh, this uh, assumption is uh, very brave, but I think that in current war, in this mobilization, uh, by sending these unexperienced uh, soldiers to the certain deaths, uh, Putin um, exercised violence not only against the enemy, Ukrainians, but against its own Russian people. And by getting a large number of victims of this war, aftermath, he can say, you see, uh, this war was just, this war was fair for us, and uh, we have a lot of casualties, uh, a lot of our warriors died uh, in this war. And just to bring you one comment, uh, Patriarch uh, Kirill of Russian Orthodox Church in one of his sermons recently mentioned that those who are on duty, of, uh, on their military duty, uh, uh, they will wash all their sins, meaning that he encouraged young soldiers to go and die for Russia, you know. That's why I think that um, a realistic approach doesn't take into account all these uh, categories of violence, of agency, of resilience, and so I think that it's not sufficient uh, for analyzing, uh, for research of the current war. Thank you. You want to comment on that? Yeah, I just wanted to, to follow up on that, and I uh, fully share uh, Julia's skepticism towards the analytical uh, value of applying the uh, geopolitical approach to understanding um, the current uh, the current war in particular, but also more generally. But I still think that there's another layer. So you have geopolitics as a category of analysis. And yes, I fully agree with, what, with everything you said. Uh, but there's also geopolitics as a category of practice. And the fact that there are a lot of politicians who think in those terms, and by thinking in those terms also act uh, in accordance with the um, implication and the expectations that are within the framework, and you end up in a situation that you uh, where you have consequences that are through uh, this uh, sort of mechanism of um, uh, of a self fulfilling prophecy, if you will. So, in that sense, the the note would be yes, uh, as a category of analysis, it doesn't help us much, but wish I should. 
uh, think that we should be careful not to disregard it as a as a thing that is out there that is very simple uh, to understand and then that, that a lot of people just reproduce it also um, in their thinking and especially politicians who are doing that. Um, and I think this is certainly something that we need to uh, have in consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Kirsten, I really want to uh, talk about the well failures and misconceptions both by German politicians and German academics uh, with regard to Ukraine and I mean or Ukraine and Russia I would say. Uh, before, in particular, after 2014. So what went wrong? So why uh, didn't we expect both the war, the resistance? Um, what, what went wrong both? I mean, in politics, but maybe um, in particular in, in, in academia. Mm -hmm. um, I think I already mentioned that in a previous talk. Um, what, what really happened... Um, first in politics and then in academia was the idea that, well, the Cold War is over. They're all uh, going to become like us. Um, this wave of democratization, this hope, and also a kind of a blindness for things that went wrong or did not really follow this, uh, this path. And within um, this way of thinking, there was also a massive reduction in research in general on Eastern Europe. Um, mm -hmm. All kinds of downsizing of institutes. You, 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 we also had that in Hessen, and mm -hmm. finally the institute ended up in in Gießen <laughs> and stuff like that. So lots of things were closed down, um, and professorships were not renewed anymore. Stuff like that. Right? Lot, uh, lots of <coughs> money was spent on other regions, on research on other regions that seemed a lot more important at the time, right? Um, so there was, first of all, lots, uh, a loss of expertise, and in most uh, research centers, unfortunately, then a focus on Russia, uh, and less a focus on all the other countries, because especially, mm -hmm. maybe you can say something about linguistics, I mean, Russians taught everywhere, right, in, in all the, uh, Slavistic uh, fields or uh, institutes, but then the question arises, okay, what other languages can we still teach? What can we afford? What does, what makes sense, right? Um, and so there was this this focus on, on Russia, Russia also in research, and just recently I saw um, a podcast which was very interesting, was the, about the Operation Barbarossa, that is the Nazi invasion um, of the Soviet Union and all historians sitting there were still always talking about how this operation is viewed in Germany and how it is viewed in Russia. Nobody talked about how is it viewed in Ukraine, how is it viewed in Belarus. No mention of that at all. There was one lady who sometimes raised her hand and said, well, we should also talk about Ukraine, <laughs> we should also talk about Belarus. But it was simply not the focus. And I think for, for, many, um, for many people or historians in, um, in Germany, this is very true, a strong focus on, on Russia. And I would like to come back to politics <laughs> again. <laughs> um, um, so you mentioned the, um, the Second World War, or then in Russia, the um, Great Patriotic War with a high number of victims. Um, and for Germany especially, there is always this kind of, on the one hand, special relationship with Russia and also this feeling of historical guilt. And if you have a look at public debates, this feeling of historical guilt is always directed towards Russia and very little to Belarus and Ukraine until recently. So there's a, a complete um, concentration on Russia and a complete ne neglect on the other countries that were severely affected by the Nazi invasion, and maybe even more than, uh, than Russia itself. Um, and in general, in public consciousness, until very recently, in Germany, I would at least say Ukraine did not really exist except for soccer. <laughs> That's basically it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, I would uh, like to uh, push this a little bit further, not only with regard to our conceptual question, research methods, but also to science diplomacy. 
Um, Monica, I mean, uh, you at Gießen and I guess also you personally do have a lot of collaborations with researchers that obviously not only in Ukraine but also Russia and Belarus. Um, so how do we deal with that <coughs> now? How do we, because I mean, there will be a kind of, or there, there's a need, obviously a need to, well, renew, continue these collaborations uh -huh. Um, because, I mean, international collaborations in academia has a, well, um, worth of itself, I would say, uh, and also contributes to our understanding, cooperation, peace at the best. Um, so how do we deal with this in science diplomacy now? Yeah, this is really a big challenge and a problem for us, for East European studies, I mean, humanities, history, yeah. linguistics, um, literary studies, and so on. We uh, don't only research with Russia, but uh, also on Russia. And now um, fieldwork is not possible, um, expert interviews in language policy not, uh, and so on. Archives uh, are closed for us, and we can't um, sub substitute um, all with digital materials, for example, or libraries uh, abroad. This is not possible. And for linguists, uh, speaker data is the most important mm -hmm. data. And this is a really a problem for us. Um, and uh, you all know the statement of the Science Foundation, German Science Foundation, who uh, had frozen the cooperation with Russia. I understand this to one point. I understand all um, um, against Russia, of course, measures. But I see it a little bit critical, because we want to have critical Russians, critical colleagues in Germany and open them our view on the history and discuss with them. And we must be in contact with the critical part of the population. This is now very difficult because now if you have contact with colleagues in Russia, this is too dangerous for them. They are marked now, yeah, if you have contact with a German colleague, you are on the other side, this is a problem. And some word in this context about Eastern European studies, what you said about the role of uh, research in Russia, um, I agree in some points, in others not. Um, of course, the research and teaching in Germany was focused on Russia, but there are reasons why it is so. It's a very big country with a lot of students and so on. And um, now we have the problem that the structures in the universities are correspondingly. We have everywhere, as you already mentioned, uh, language uh, education in Russian, but not in Ukrainian. And if we, if we want now to foster uh, Ukrainian studies, it's not so quickly possible because a Russian teacher can't speak tomorrow Ukrainian or teach in Ukrainian. This is not uh, possible. So the uh, university structures contradict now a little bit the new challenges uh, in, in the humanities. And another aspect um, about the role of research on Russia. Um, um, sometimes in media we can read that Eastern European studies failed, um, that they didn't foresee uh, the, uh, the war. Uh, this is not our task, I think, to foresee the war. It's for only Putin who could do this. Um, and um, he, um, we should look on the discussion uh, about the future role of the humanities in a more differentiated way, I think. Now everybody speaks and discusses about, about decolonization of Eastern European studies. The focus must be more outside Russia on other post-Soviet countries. In sociolinguistics, we had this already since the uh, three decades now. There is a very strong, intensive research and teaching about um, Central Asian republics, for example, Belarus, language policy in Belarus, and so on. And I don't like this black and white um, a painting um, with regard to the future directions in research. Yes, we had a strong uh, focus on Russia, this is true, but it's not too black-white in this sense. And um, a last point, uh, maybe um, you are from political sciences or conflict studies, I'm a representative of a comparably small subject, uh, Slavistics. And my colleagues from Eastern European history are in the same situation. Um, universities are financed by student numbers. This is a problem for all small subjects. And if we want to now to, to build up or foster Ukrainian studies, what does it mean? We have only a few students. And who, and who will finance this? Who will uh, build up such uh, structures? 
this is very unclear now in the in the discussion. So on the one hand, we have all the willing, we have the desire to build it up, to foster it, but on the other hand, we have financial uh, restrictions and um, established structures. Yeah, thank you, Monica. I mean, this this really makes clear that I mean, this is not a abstract theoretical question. How a, a society and also I mean politics create expertise for, I mean, being prepared for such situations. So mm. it's really about investing money, right? Investing money, putting money into the universities, in research hubs, and so on and yeah. so forth. And with that, you can build expertise. And if you downsize this, as you mentioned, yeah. if you downsize this, you will, you will lose expertise. And at the end, you will have a lack of expertise. Yeah, right? May I at some point <laughs> maybe? Yes, uh, we, we do need uh, more expertise in, uh, uh, concerning Eastern Europe. But there is another point. We have a lot of expertise. And a lot of uh, political scientists, historians, and other uh, linguists also wrote about Putin's threats against the West already uh, 10 years uh, ago and, and even more. Um, they uh, warned uh, about these threats, Putin's threats. Um, but it seems to me that media, politicians, and so on didn't hear them in us. This is another problem. Not only we have to create expertise and bring it to the society. I think uh, today we must discuss more. For example, um, everybody discusses in great uh, um, institutions, uh, research institutions about the role of knowledge transfer into the society. This is now the key word everywhere in the world. But um, we should look on the other side. Uh, me the media, the politicians must um, take the knowledge from us, come to the universities and hear what we have to say. And this doesn't happen. They have some uh, institutions outside the university, um, they correspond with them and uh, listen what they have to say, but they have to um, to hear more intensively what university research in Eastern Europe has to say. This is my opinion. This well, the nice thing is that uh, with the Trace Network, this is actually, we got money uh, for actually doing this, so we will do this in the next four years and hopefully we will be listening. So there's a bit of time left for a for a few questions from the room. So uh, maybe we can uh, collect a couple of and please introduce yourself, just name, affiliation, study program, whatever, and also mention uh, to whom the re the question is then uh, directed. I see already three hands over there, over there, and over there. Yeah. Uh, yes, my name is Evan. Studies program, and um, my question is for Dr. Monica Benenda. Um, and I believe you touched on this earlier, but I was curious because uh, Russia historically has limited production of literature and um, other national languages, Ukrainian, Lithuanian, etc. Um, what do you see evidence? What evidence do you see of this in a modern internet context of you know pan Slavism and that sort of thing? Um. Can we collect first? I'm not sure whether I understood correctly okay. what is your question <laughs> about the and before it was books, limiting books and banning books and that sort of and other literature. What is it in the internet? Like in internet social media, what does it look like? Have you, have you come across that? I think historically, like the Ukrainian language was banned, Lithuanian publications were banned like centuries ago. In the, in the 19th century, yeah, yeah. there were uh, language bans against Ukrainian, yes, of course. I was wondering how that relates to the internet today. What are they doing with other national languages you know, within Russia or outside oh, okay. of Russia? Ah, yeah. And we can, I mean, you can come back to this yeah. well and then collect and then, yeah. Thank you for this interesting discussion. So far, my name is Elina Ventrota, I'm a person of institutional economics here in Marburg. And my thought may be a little bit provocative, but we are talking about research markets here and um, having discussed the dual use opportunities of uh, research uh, quite a bit in the Senate here, um, I never thought about survey data as dual use, but up to today, <laughs> uh, maybe we want to uh, rethink uh, whether it's sensible to ask people what would you do if uh, there is a full-scale war um, uh, in your country? Will you just stay at home? Oh yeah, it's probably something that may uh, trigger actions that we don't want to trigger. And, um, 
not to be doing the work on that. So that's boiling down, I think, to information generation with information usage uh, by uh, political actors. And that's probably something that's important uh, to this category to, to use as well. Yeah, can, I guess we can reflect on, on that in a minute, and then we have a question over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question to you, David Michelle. I'm a Ukrainian student from Kiev Middle Academy, and I'm asking, as a Ukrainian, uh, you mentioned the humanization of the uh, enemy on the part of uh, Russia. Do you think there is a even small chance of the humanization of uh, the enemy on the part of the Ukrainians? And because it's clear that Russia wants to drive us into this game, you know, <coughs> and each other. And uh, what are those values and uh, anchors that we can hold on to, not to be provoked to the same? And then maybe a, a last question from over there. Sorry, if, if, if there's no time. No, go ahead. No, no, it's fine. It's kind of, it's kind of a broad question to the entire film, but I was most interested in what Julia Pinchava and Marga Vindo have to say about it. Um, I'm, my name's Maren. I'm with uh, the Peace and Public Studies uh, group Well. And um, I'm particularly interested in the linguistics of the, of, of the choice of the word terrorism and the weaponization of it. And I heard that you had uh, mentioned earlier that it is used as, as a weapon to legitimize. And I wanted to I wanted to hear if you guys could talk about like more of what you observed with that from both sides. Has Russia been calling like when has Russia been calling Ukraine terrorists in which context and vice versa? How is that? How have we observed that term being weaponized? Can we see it from other conflict parties as well? General thoughts, if you guys found anything interesting there. Any more questions? If not, I would close the queue and give the panelists the chance to go to the with the A, the answers. Uh, as a, and this would be also a, a last round for the panelists, so please now you can comment on everything which is still on, on your list, and I would go maybe from the left to the right if you're fine with it, starting with Monica and then uh, ending with Kirsten. Yeah, yeah, thank you for your question regarding languages in the internet. There were attempts in the last uh, months, um, years, to limit it uh, a bit, the Russian language, the role of Russian in the internet, because of of course, internet is Russian-dominated, this is uh, clear. But this is not in, a, um, in the sense of a language ban. This is more in the context of the new state language law of Ukraine, um, to foster Ukrainian language, to spread it in the society against the dominance of the Russian language, above all in media, social media, and so on, in this sense. It's more uh, to foster Ukrainian language. And your question about language is a weapon, this is, of course, um, a uh, kind of weaponization um, in the frame of language policy, but more, um, if I take uh, Poroshenko as an example, in the sense of national state ideology. One nation, one uh, language. This was his ideology in the last election campaign, and in this sense, he used this language as a weapon. Thanks. Julia. Uh, yes, uh, regarding the chances of using the humanization by Ukrainians uh, against uh, Russia, yes, uh, I think that uh, it's a very good question because uh, there are a lot of chances, especially given the later tactics of uh, Russians to target <coughs> civilians, and there is a lot of anger uh, among Ukrainians and within Ukrainian society because this is really uh, a <coughs> terroristic tactics to target unarmed civilians. But uh, what I observe, I haven't meant um, specific dehumanization mechanism or instrument. What I meant a lot that Ukrainian society elaborated some human mechanisms to tackle uh, with this assault. And uh, what is more important, I think, that uh, all Ukrainian society, all people, are very much want some kind of justice. And in uh, their belief that there will be some uh, uh, procedure, criminal procedure against these military criminals, uh, they pretty much um, try uh, not uh, to 
uh, use uh, the same dehumanizing tactics against Russians. And uh, President Zelensky also always <coughs> mentioned that we need to uh, stay focused, we need to uh, be actually humans in treating even uh, Russian prisoners and Russian soldiers. Uh, that's why very, it's a very um, uh, valid point. And regarding terrorism, uh, yes, this term is used very widely currently, and I already mentioned that Russia uses it kind of uh, another rhetorical um, twist regarding uh, Ukrainians. And you know that from Ukrainian side, it's also widely used. But what we do and what we want, we want uh, to uh, convince international society to formally, officially admit Russia as a, a terrorist state. Because, uh, and I know that just recently, yesterday or day before yesterday, uh, there were some um, uh, some regulations, some decisions on the level of uh, European Council. Uh, so it's like a very uh, useful formal instruments we are heading to. Uh, yeah, but it, I think that it couldn't be compared, especially uh, from the United States perspective, uh, the energy uh, admitting Russia as a terrorist state. Uh, will mean, of course, a lot of economic implications and further sanctions. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah if I can, I, I would also like to pick up on, on the on a, on the very uh, interesting question on the um, instrumentalization of uh, of terrorism. Um, and I fully agree. For in, in the Ukrainian case, it's engaging the international audience and uh, sort of scaling up the relevance of the conflict to the international community. Um, in contrast, uh, I think what happens in Russia and the way it's used in Russia, it's actually to diminish the significance of particular events. Uh, so, for example, uh, blowing up the bridge or uh, the mass shooting um, in the mobilization camp. These are terrorist attacks, as in these are individual uh, events that are not part of anything big. So it's the sense here is to, to make it, to distinguish it from what's going on um, uh, on the battleground and to reduce it. Uh, so in that sense, there's a different way in yeah, which I the agree. meaning of the, of the term is, is leveraged in, in both countries. Um, yeah, I'll end it. At. Okay, thank you. Yeah, with the <laughs> dual use of research data, just <laughs> to clarify the whole thing, um, as far as I remember, um, that was already after the separatists had taken over I in the region, but maybe before the referenda. So uh, it was not Russia having a look at the, the data and then deciding, okay, we're going to do that in the Donbass. It was rather that they tried it in many regions and they only succeeded there, right? Or well, supporting uh, separatists there. Um, but I would say if um, Russia or Putin had really taken seriously surveys in Ukraine, had a look at it, he wouldn't ha shouldn't have invaded, right? Because all the, um, the ideas of people um, actually being Russian, feeling Russian, wanting to be liberated, I mean, if you have a look at surveys before that, it was obvious that was just crap, right? And um, and especially since 2014, as the experience of a war in the country has really changed attitudes of people, um, both towards uh, Russia, but also towards actions that now seemed possible, as um, Julia already mentioned, uh, in a way of resistance or being able to defend yourself because you've already had the experience with the war. It didn't start this year, right? Well, thank you very much. I think we need to come to an end. Thank you much uh, to the panelists, but also to the audience for contributions and your attention. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to send our best wishes to our Ukrainian colleagues and assure them our solidarity um, in this war. Um, and I also would like to mention that in the recent months we have seen how important international cooperation in academia is and how much it has helped um, to achieve um, understanding of the war in the German public, uh, but also to be able to help scholars at risk quite uh, quickly. And on that background, 
On the background of the situation in Germany and the ongoing discussion in Germany, I would like to stress that any substantial cut in the budget for external science policy therefore risks, and we, we discussed this already in the panel, uh, risk this important um, function of international academic exchange. I think this is really substantial in particular uh, in this uh, situation of political crisis um, and in this particular um, important that Germany sticks to its uh, well, constructive role in international academic um, exchange. And with this I would like to uh, close this first event. Um, for more information about our research at the Trade Centre, please visit uh, the website where you can also find uh, information about the upcoming uh, lectures in this series. So next Tuesday, same time, same location, Max Pichel from the University of Kassel will talk about the NSU complex as an example of parliamentary investigations into right-wing terrorism. Again, a timely topic with the lecture series. But uh, well, please join me in a, in for applause for our panelists and have a nice evening.